When I was a little kid, the two things I loved most in life were Godzilla and NES games. So naturally, when Godzilla Monster of Monsters came out, it was like a dream come true. Well, almost. To sum it up, most of the game revolved around getting through very repetitive outer space levels while smashing up tanks and jets, then fighting against Godzilla's monster enemies. Overall, it was pretty mediocre, but back then, I didn't care. When I got the game as a present for my 10th birthday, I played it night and day as much as I could. Unfortunately, I had traded the game for Amagon a year later, much to my regret when I found out what that game was like. Recently, I had bought a new NES system, and through a lot of hunting and asking around, my friend finally managed to find a copy of Godzilla Monster of Monsters. I was pumped to play my favorite childhood game. It never even occurred to me to ask where he found it. He also gave me some other games like Legend of Zelda, Bomberman, and some stupid thing called Action 52. But Godzilla had to come first. So I started the game, and the nostalgia came flooding back like a tidal wave. Godzilla's 8-bit theme song flooded proudly through the speakers, and I was soon grinning like an idiot. Some people laugh at me for playing such outdated games, but I've never had as much enjoyment for any other games than those on the NES. Those games take me back to when things were much simpler. More safe. But after what's happened with this game, I don't have those feelings anymore. I forgot how quick the fun of smashing things as Godzilla wore off in the scrolling levels. The game bombards you with bullets and things crashing into you from every direction, and you're too big to avoid most of them. Although my excitement had worn down some, it wasn't long at all before I got to my first boss battle. My first opponent was Gizora, an obscure squid kaiju who had never been in a Godzilla movie. The most annoying thing about fighting Gizora is that he always backs you into a corner and starts smacking you with his tentacle, and you're unable to move at all until he gets off you. This move doesn't even do any damage, but it can stall you until the timer runs out and you have to start the fight over. It's as annoying as it sounds. And of course, he did it when I fought him. Only, for some reason, this time... it caused the game to glitch up. Because once he started smacking me, he never stopped. The timer's supposed to end the fight in about 40 seconds, but this lasted for nearly 5 minutes. After a while, the graphics started to mess up, with little red blocks all over the place. Which was weird, but I just took the game out, blew on it, and started again. I wasn't about to let a little glitch stand in my way. So I started again, and this time defeated Gizora and the level's other boss monster, Mogira, without any problems. So then it was on to the next planet, Mars. I browsed around on the board and found something interesting. Where Varen's piece should have been, there was instead a piece representing Titanosaurus. There were only ten kaiju in the game, and Titanosaurus was not one of them. Or so I thought. Maybe Titanosaurus was originally intended to be in the game, but was swapped out with Varen for some reason? So I got very excited. Not only was I playing my favorite game, but I was playing a prototype of some sort, with a new monster! Needless to say, I ran through the levels as fast as I could to see Titanosaurus in action. I fought Gizora again and beat him before he could do his tentacle smack, but this time the glitch started happening when he died. Gizora's sprite didn't sink to the bottom, but it seemed to be devoured by the glitch, and his eyes started spawning all over the screen. I know now that these glitches with Gizora were my first warning sign that something was very wrong with this game. But I ignored it, and proceeded on to fight Mogira, who this time had a glitch of his own. He was twice the size he should have been, which startled me. He was also considerably harder to beat than usual, which is to say not at all, but soon I had defeated him also. And when he died, yet another glitch happened. This happened extremely fast, so I was lucky to get a screen cap of it at all. But what happened was the giant Mogira sprite started to shatter and melt. At this point, I was about to fight Titanosaurus, and I was worried as to what kind of glitches would happen this time. But to my surprise, he looked just fine. 
Although all the game's bipedal monsters were the same height, Titanosaurus was a bit taller. But since Titanosaurus actually was taller than Godzilla in his film debut, I thought that was kinda cool. After a very fun fight with the monster that wasn't supposed to be in the game, I took over the enemy base and proceeded not to Jupiter like normal, but instead to... Pathos. Pathos was the same as Jupiter in the layout, except the board was dark blue rather than green. The first thing I noticed was that all the usual level icons had been replaced by a blue rock and some kind of orange honeycomb shape. I checked the other side of the board to see the new monster. Instead of Hedora, it was Biolante. But that couldn't have been right. Godzilla vs. Biolante didn't come out until 1989, and this game was made in 1988. Maybe they put Biolante in the game to build excitement for the movie next year, but changed their minds? I tried to rationalize the game's abnormalities any way I could, but this would prove to be futile. Pathos' map song was the first new song I heard in the game. Like most of the new songs, it was hard to describe, but I'll try. It started out slow and suspenseful, much slower than any song in the game. But every 12 seconds or so, there would be a loud clashing sound, and the tempo changed. It was like the composer randomly played parts from five different songs with the same instruments. I moved Godzilla over to one of the many blue rock icons and started the level. It resembled a blue mountain range with a blood-red planet in the sky. But there was something odd about the mountains. They had a shredded paper look to them. I thought at first maybe the glitch had affected it, but it looked far too intentional. I also noticed something else about this level. There were no enemies at all. Not even any obstacles. So, without having to focus on anything, I listened to the music while walking through the level. It had a sorrowful feel to it. It would have been rather pleasant had I heard it in a normal game. The level went on for three screens, but with no obstacles around, I finished it very quickly. I tried other levels of the same type to see if any enemies appear, but there were none. There was little else to be seen in the Blue Mountains, so I tried the other level type. I started one of the orange levels, and my eyes were assaulted with a grotesque background of tumorous orange eyes. The sky was the same as the ground, so I assumed the game was indicating this level takes place in a cave. The only enemies here were Matango spawn, but as you can see, the little bastards were everywhere. The music certainly didn't help, with a mixture of screeching sounds and loud drum beats that sounded like a monster's theme in a horror film. After completing it, I tried to avoid playing through any more of these levels whenever I could. The map was short, so it was only a few minutes before I headed towards a rematch with Gizora and Mogira. But this time, their sprites and attack patterns were vastly different. I fought Mogira first. Its replacement was a flying machine with a slight resemblance to a Pascagoula alien. It attacked by spinning its front tentacle like a corkscrew, and it still had an eye beam except now it fired from the drill. This lanky aberration had replaced Gizora, and the new beast was more of a challenge. It would run and jump at a fast pace, constantly swinging its arms around making it hard to get close. And of course, it tried to pin me in the corner with as much annoying resolve as ever. I defeated it using a combination of tail whips and heat beam spamming. I defeated them, and was going to fight Titanosaurus, but when I started the fight, he was nowhere to be seen, and the game simply went back to the map with the Titanosaurus piece now missing. There was no one left to fight now but Biolante, so I started the battle. I was surprised that Biolante started the fight in her rose form. She was immobile and used the tentacles to keep me away from the main body, which took the most damage. As expected, she turned into her final form after taking enough damage. The battle technique was the same, except now Biolante could move, albeit slower than any other monster. 
Being hit by the tentacles did more damage now, and Violente could do an acid spit. Not much more difficult to beat than Titanosaurus. It only took two rounds. But when Violente was gone, the music had stopped, and there was a new icon replacing the bass. This icon wasn't there before I beat Violante. It resembled a red tribal mask, and I had a feeling of dread when I saw it. But since it replaced the base, it must be the only way to exit Pathos. I moved Godzilla to the square and started the level. It was a hellish looking place with no sky, and a flickering fire in the background. All the text on the top of the screen and the life bar were gone. In their place was a single bit of text in the middle of the screen that said, Run. My feeling of dread had intensified. I cautiously walked through the level, but like the Blue Mountains, there were no enemies. I paced around for a minute thinking, Run? From what? The first time it hit me, I didn't even see it. I heard a noise outside my room and turned back to see if something fell. And when I looked back, Godzilla was dying. I figured it must have just been a glitch, but I wasn't going to play through the game without Godzilla, so I restarted and went back to the password screen. Have I ever mentioned how creepy the password screen music is? If you've played the game, you know what I mean. It doesn't at all fit the mood of the game. It's more like something from a horror game. Maybe they made it like that so kids wouldn't cheat. I was kind of annoyed at this point, because I thought I was going to have to fight all the monsters again, but that didn't happen. The game started me off right where I was before I started the red face level. So I tried again, making sure to pay attention this time. That's when I heard a low bellowing sound. And then I saw it. This... thing. I haven't seen all the Godzilla movies, but I'm pretty damn sure this was never in any of them. It had to be something the creators made up. But what kind of sick fuck would put this in a children's game? By sheer dumb luck, or perhaps the adrenaline boost, I managed to run away fast enough to get away from it. It ran very fast, so much so that if you saw it, you were almost certainly going to die. Once I had gone back to the map, I was so afraid that I was extremely tempted to just shut the game off and pretend this never happened. I could not believe what I had just seen. It couldn't have been real. And even if I wanted to continue, I still had to get Mothra through this chase level. But as I stayed inactive on the map screen for a few minutes, my fear was replaced by burning curiosity. What the hell had just happened? What was the rest of the game like? I only had to beat this level with Mothra and then it was on to the next world. But when I moved Mothra to the red face, the game registered it as me beating the level. I was relieved. I tried to prepare myself for the next world, Trance. I was still pretty shook up from the last level when I started Trance, and the map music didn't do anything to ease the tension. As for how to describe it, have you ever heard the theme from Videodrome? That's the closest thing I could think of to compare it to. I checked to see who the new monster was, and it was Orga, a monster who didn't make his film debut until 2000, appearing in a game made in 1988. So much for my theories about Titanosaurus and Biollante. There's no way this game was made in 1988. Those guys at Toho may be smart, but I'm sure they couldn't see that far into the future. If they could, they never would have gave Roland Emmerich the rights to make a Godzilla movie. This had to be a hack of some kind, which just opened up even more questions. Who made this hack? When? How? And most importantly, why? My immediate assumption was to think that my friend did this to pull a joke on me, but that couldn't be right either. He didn't know how to make a ROM hack. And even if he did, he'd probably just do something simple and stupid like replacing all the monsters with crudely drawn genitalia. 
Unless he had amazing game editing skills and a serious dark streak to his imagination that he never told me about, he couldn't have made this. Aside from all that, my eye was drawn to the new icon on the map, a question mark. I was really curious as to what it did. I'm sure you're also curious, so I'll explain the quiz levels now, since this is when they start appearing. There was one of these per map from here on, and they always appeared near the start. When you start a quiz level, you appear on a screen like this. As you can see, there's a question at the top, a yes and no button, and an emoticon in the center. I refer to the emoticon as face, real creative I know. And for convenience, I'll refer to face as the one asking the questions. The music for the quiz levels was actually a track that was in the game. It's the one that plays when you try to use the Ghidorah cheat code and get sent to an unplayable level. Anyway, Face asks you 12 yes or no questions, and you move your monster to the buttons for your answer. When you answer, the question disappears and Face changes expressions for about 8 seconds. Then he goes back to neutral and a new question comes up. There was no time limit, nor any right or wrong answers. Face has no respect for the player's personal boundaries, and will sometimes ask deeply disturbing and personal questions. For example, do you like hurting people? Have you ever killed or raped anyone? Or have you been molested by a family member? Other times, he would just ask questions that were either mind-numbingly stupid, like is the sun hot, or is water wet, or just flat out ridiculous, like does your dog like the president. And maybe once per quiz, he would ask you a question about the game. With one exception, Face's expression changes seem to have no effect on the game, except for indicating what the game creator thought of your answer. His reactions rarely made any sense, and at first I thought they were randomly generated. The questions never followed a pattern, he never stayed on the same subject for more than two questions. Early on, there were questions that made me think that Face was building up to something, only to then ask some stupid garbage. Here are the expressions of Face that I saw while playing. I'll separate them into two categories, the expressions I understood, and the expressions I didn't. First are the expressions I understood. Neutral, his default expression. Angry. If you try to attack Face, his expression changes to this, but nothing else happens. Sad. Happy. Sick. Maniacal. Surprised. Love. Annoyed. Confused. And guilty or hurt. Here are the others. Two of these only appeared once, numbers 1 and 12, and I suspected they might have been in-jokes from the creator. Their respective questions were, Do you like ice cream? and Are you a tough guy? As for the questions in the first quiz, luckily I had a notepad and pen handy. I have problems remembering things, so I often carry one around to jot things down. So when the first quiz started, I thought I'd record what happened. I'm glad I did. Here are the first series of questions, my answers, and Face's reaction. Do you like the game? Yes. Happy. Are you afraid? Yes. Surprised. Are you over 18? Yes. Weird face number 5. Do birds have teeth? No. Love. Is peanut butter good? No. Sick. Does the moon rotate? Yes. Weird face number 11. Have you had a job? Yes. Confused. Do you like hurting people? No. Annoyed. Is the sun hot? Yes. Sad. Do you like dogs? Yes. Happy. Is the president good? Yes. Weird face number three. Does your dog like the president? No. Angry. Now that I've explained all that, time for the gameplay. After the quiz level, I tried the new green temple icon first. Wow. 
Maybe this is why the game is so weird. One of the designers was clearly drugged out of his mind. Jokes aside, I was impressed by the graphics of this level, as disorienting as they were. But I hate those creepy, blank, staring statue faces. There were two new enemies in this level. A flying ghost thing with a trunk, and a bat with a horse skull for a face. They appear at random, but I was lucky to get a screen cap of them both. Then I proceeded to a blue mountain level, expecting another nice, calm stroll. I took my time walking through, and was completely taken by surprise when this happened. Not Mogira came speeding towards me and took off quite a bit of health with his tentacle screws. It only took me two minutes to kill him without having to worry about a time limit, but the boss monsters never showed up in the scrolling levels in the normal game. I was worried about what other rules the game would break. After another Blue Mountain stage, it was time to fight Not Varen, whose replacement was one of the most bizarre things in the game. This strange creature attacks you by kicking, and also opening its chest up to fire heat-seeking missiles. I still don't get it. The missiles were sometimes a pain to deal with, but I found out you could easily tail whip them out of the way. Not Varen was probably the easiest of the monster replacements. The same could not be said for Not Hidora. Apparently the source of the horse bats, Not Hidora was the most aggravatingly difficult monster to fight yet, mostly because of his special ability. He could shriek and summon a small swarm of those horse bat things. I know there's only two in the screen cap, but every time he did this, about ten would arrive. The AI took advantage of the distraction and attacked twice as fast while the horse bats were flying around. Once that annoyance was dealt with, I went through a green temple level to kill some enemies and restore my health. Interestingly, none of the horse bats showed up after Not Hidora was killed. And that was when I got this idea. If killing all the monsters makes the red face show up, what would happen if I avoid fighting Orga and go straight to the base? So I gave that a try. The game told me there was no monster there when I tried to start the base level. And immediately afterward, the game took control of my Godzilla piece and moved it in front of Orga. My little trick didn't work, so I tried to prepare myself for another chase. But first, I had to beat Orga. The fight with Orga confirmed another thing. Whoever created this game hack was clearly a Godzilla fan. Not only because they picked a monster like Orga, but because they actually implemented something that happened in Godzilla 2000 in a really neat way. His primary attacks were a punch and a heat beam from his shoulder cavity. But once you got him down to half his health, he did something new. He would expand his jaws and try to swallow Godzilla, stealing your health and energy in the process. But in doing so, he gave himself a new weakness. Firing a heat beam into his mouth would take four life bars off his meter. With that weakness revealed, I soon beat Orga, and despite how much I had hoped otherwise, the red face appeared on the map where the base was, and the music stopped. I readied myself as best I could. I started the level. And seeing that it was basically the same as the first, I didn't waste a millisecond before I started hauling ass. I encountered some obstacles in the form of the ground tile suspended in the air. Most of them you could jump over or destroy, but others you had to crouch under. About 40 seconds into it, I heard that bellowing roar and saw the spider beast following close behind me. Stacks of obstacles barely slowed it down. It would back up and then charge its way through them, smashing them into bits. And when the smaller obstacles got in the way, it would expand its jaws and swallow them whole. I was scared, but with fast thinking and faster button pressing, I escaped in yet again. I felt really excited, so I laughed and said, Not this time, asshole! I decided to take a screen cap to celebrate. But when I said that sentence, just before the level ended, the monster did something that made my blood run cold. It looked at me. That wave of mortal terror overtook me again. And I sure as hell wasn't laughing anymore.
When I got back to the game, I was getting very upset and confused. I thought about the way the monster looked at me. The game couldn't have heard what I said. That's impossible. It had to be a random occurrence. But why did it happen precisely at the moment I insulted the monster? Nothing about this game made any sense. The new Godzilla monsters, the weird replacement monsters, out of place imagery like the green temples, quiz levels, and the monster chases. It didn't seem to add up in any kind of meaningful way. If it was a prank, it wasn't funny in any way I could understand, and they clearly put far too much effort into it. If they were trying to make a genuine sequel with new Godzilla monsters, then why did they add everything else? Maybe it was some kind of art experiment? Some group project made by a bunch of really talented and crazy people, and they lost the cartridge somehow? Or maybe they intended for some random person to find it. It was all just fruitless guessing. As far as I could tell, there was only one way to figure out what the deal with this game was. To play it through to the end. Maybe, just maybe, there would be something in the credits. Like an explanation by the creators as to why they made this. Or it could be something much more cryptic and strange. Maybe even something horrifying. Before I got a good look at the dementia board, I considered replaying Trance to see if the red monster would look at me again. But I decided against it. I wanted to keep moving forward. I was also somewhat worried that backtracking might cause the game to become even more strange. The dementia board music sounded a lot like the Saturn music, except it was slowed down. Like most of these new map themes, it had a dangerous, suspenseful feel. While listening to the music, I looked at the dementia board. There were four boss monsters this time. Space Godzilla, Manda, Gigan, and Baragon. I was surprised that there were two new Toho monsters this time, but the best surprise was still to come. I started the quiz level. Here's another list of results in the same format as the last one. Can you swim? Yes. Happy. Do you like fish? Yes. Sick. Can penguins fly? No. Sad. Can it spin in all directions? There was no clarification of what face meant by it, so I just guessed. No. Surprised. Breathe oxygen. Yes. Weird face number eight. Does it taste good when you bite a woman? I don't know who came up with this question, but I really hope they're getting mental help. No. Annoyed. Is it night where you are? Yes. Weird face number six. Do you like cats? Yes. Confused. Is water wet? Yes. Angry. Have you ever broken a bone? No. Happy. Do you like your job? Yes. Hurt. Would you like a new monster? Yes. Weird face number 11. I wasn't entirely sure at the time what face meant by new monster, but I couldn't resist answering yes just to see what would happen. The result was mind-blowing. The game took me back to the board and I had a new playable monster in the form of Anguirus. Ever since I was a kid I always wanted to play as Anguirus since he was my second favorite Godzilla monster. And plus, I never liked Mothra all that much. I moved my new Anguirus piece over to the level right next to it. Before I get to the level description, I'll talk about Anguirus a bit. Using the up and down buttons, you could choose whether Anguirus stood in a bipedal stance or crawled around on all fours. It wasn't a huge difference, but being able to stand was helpful in boss fights, and crawling sometimes helps dodge obstacles and attacks. He could punch and kick like Godzilla, but no tail whip. Instead, he had something far more interesting. The ability to curl up into a spiked ball of death and roll around. 
you could still take damage, but it was lessened. It was a good way of clearing out stage enemies, but unfortunately doing this also drained the power bar. But the spiked ball wasn't his only ability. When you pressed start, he would fire a beam of energy from his mouth. It resembled Titanosaurus's sonar attack, and if this were a hack, it may have been inspired by the roar attack from Atari's Godzilla fighting games. Now on to the level. As you might have guessed from the level icon, these are green palette swaps of the ground and background tiles from the Blue Mountains. But what immediately caught my attention was the water, which has a transparency effect. Is that even possible for an NES game? I know the Super Nintendo could do it, but I had never seen a transparency effect in a game on the NES. Anyway, I went through the usual strolling through the level, and again, there were no monsters or anything. But pretty soon, I had reached a cliff above the water. There was nowhere to go but into the water, so down I went. The water transparency made things a bit harder to see, but it's tolerable. After going underwater, I encountered two new enemies. A giant piranha and some kind of spiky bottom feeder thing. I liked the piranha, because I could easily tell what it was. It was a sane enemy design that would appear in a real game. And there were very few enemies like this. They didn't take many hits to kill, but they were pretty annoying, and could considerably trim down your life if they got close enough. They also tend to travel in packs. As for the bottom feeders, they're easy to deal with. They swim along the bottom of the screen towards you, and are easily crushed with the roll attack or jumped over. In this screen cap, you can see me about to run one of them over, and there's a pack of piranha behind it. After I beat that level, I moved Godzilla onto the blue castle icon. I started the level and I got a title screen with the text, Unforgiving Cold. The level itself looked like a castle dungeon made of blue bricks, with rows of identical white statue faces on the walls. These faces had a permanent look of horror on their faces. There was also some flickering grey static, which didn't really obscure my vision, but it adds to the very unsettling mood of these levels. The music was a 12 second loop of a low pitched choir vocalizing. Whenever I played through one of these levels, I got this sudden horrible feeling of anxiety. I had the feeling that the further I progressed, the closer I was getting to something unspeakably evil. There weren't any enemies, but these were some of the longest levels in the game. It took seven minutes to complete. I didn't want to admit it to myself at the time, but I realized something playing the Blue Castle level. This game has the power to make the player feel certain things. I don't mean in the sense that you get irritated playing a crappy game, or get unnerved by playing something scary in a game. What I mean is that certain events in this game can instantly make you start feeling something. I know that sounds completely insane. I don't blame you for not believing me. I wouldn't believe any of this either if I didn't play the game myself. But there is something very, very wrong with this game. And I still don't know how to explain it. So, then it was time to fight Baragon's replacement. Although Baragon was originally the smallest monster in the game, his replacement was the largest. It was so tall that the ground was noticeably lowered, and not Baragon's head still barely avoided collision with the bar at the top of the screen. You may be wondering how he attacks without arms. Well, he has the most powerful kick in the game, but his other fighting technique is much stranger. First, he blasts a cloudy breath of pixels down at you, which causes you to freeze. Then he walks back to the right corner of the screen and... extends a huge Gatling gun from his abdomen. That might seem amusing to you, but it certainly wasn't to me when I was playing the game. This attack is almost as annoying as Gigant's saw, 
and not Baragon could have been unbeatable if he consistently used it. Thankfully, he only did it twice while fighting him. Once you unfreeze, you can run up and start damaging the gun, which does extra damage to him. This helped me to destroy him, and when it was time to play the third level type, I decided that I was going to use Anguirus to fight Manda and Gigan, and then fight Space Godzilla as Godzilla. It was only fitting. Before getting into the battles, I'll describe the third level type, the Arctic. It's exactly what you'd guess from the name, an icy tundra with a few watery segments. The music reminded me a bit of Northern Hemispheres from Donkey Kong Country, in 8-bit form. A very dangerous sounding song. It made me think about being trapped in a tundra and freezing to death. There were two new enemies in this stage. The first was a creature frozen in a block of ice. They block your way and you have to use the heat beam to thaw them out of the ice. They look a bit like a smaller version of Not Gizora, only without the eye. When freed, they do a strange crawling movement and push you backwards. It doesn't cause any damage, but it's a bit annoying. After dealing with the Iceman, I kept walking for a minute or two and came upon a water segment. I jumped in, and this time I managed to get a screen cap showing how the water splashes when you jump in. Don't know how they programmed that, but it's pretty impressive. Here you can see the other new enemy, a little thing I call Spike Walker. They walk towards you and explode randomly, or instantly if you attack them, sending spikes in every direction. They don't do that much damage, but they did get me dangerously close to falling into a pit a few times. Speaking of pits, down into the water the game has a platformer element, bottomless pits. There weren't any of these in the original, since it was strictly an action game, but the pits were a neat addition. After getting back on land, I encountered a very unexpected mini-boss, Maguma, the Walrus Kaiju. I know this game had some obscure monsters to begin with, but wow. Not that I'm complaining, it's a pretty cool cameo for an unappreciated kaiju. Maguma's fighting tactics were very simple. He had a freeze beam, and then he could charge into you. Not very challenging, but certainly more entertaining than the Matango mini-boss from the original game. One really interesting thing about Maguma is that he doesn't die when you defeat him. He turns tail and retreats. This was the first time I had ever seen an enemy monster change direction, let alone retreat. I tried to chase after him, but he disappeared after I got in the water. Poor bastard. And that does it for the Arctic. I'll talk about the Manda fight next. Manda was a fairly crafty opponent. When it realized one tactic was ineffective, it would immediately change to a different one. It used quite a few tricks, like spitting fire, biting, and the most irritating of all, constricting. It doesn't mercilessly drain your life down like Gigant's Cutter, but it was by far Manda's strongest attack. One last thing to note that I found pretty cool was that the Atragon showed up during the fight to help me out. Manda crushed it with ease, but it was still cool. After I slayed Manda, I played through an arctic level for health power-ups, and then it was on to Gigan's replacement. When the fight started, I was very confused because there was nothing there. I thought this was going to be like the Titanosaurus fight in Pathos, but just about the time it would have been going back to the map, a piranha appeared on the screen. But it wasn't there for long. As soon as it appeared, the speakers emitted an ear-splitting screech, and not Gigan flew in and ripped the poor fish into pieces. Well, that's one way to get the player on their toes. That abrupt entrance scared the hell out of me and got my adrenaline rushing, which in retrospect was a good thing, because not Gigan was one of the fastest, most unrelenting opponents in the game. Not Gigan was tough but my new skills with Anguirus helped to even the score. And this was still an incredibly intense fight. Not Gigan's attacks consisted of some kind of blood laser he spews from his mouth, 
and a downward slash. I was expecting some kind of hellish variant of the buzzsaw attack, but thankfully there didn't seem to be one. The howl attack was invaluable in defeating him. I would have taken more screen caps of the fight, but I really had to concentrate. After that, there was just one monster left to take down. Space Godzilla. As mentioned earlier, I used Godzilla for the fight. Space Godzilla's fighting technique was really frustrating, but admittedly a very clever idea. He would use his energy to create two flying crystals, which would reach the ground and become crystal spires. These spires would not only block you from reaching Space Godzilla, but it also allowed him to constantly recharge to full energy and blast you with a deadly Corona Beam until you broke the spires. Space Godzilla would eventually drain his own spires of energy until they shattered, but if you waited for that to happen, you'd probably lose a lot of life. Heat beams actually seemed to re-energize the spires, so you had to use physical attacks. When you finally got close enough to hit Space Godzilla, he was no pushover. When I punched him, he hit me back just as hard. Space Godzilla does everything in his power to knock you back to the left corner of the screen, so he can create more spires. By the time this was over, I only had about 5 life bars left. But it didn't matter, because I didn't need to fight anymore. I needed to run. Here we go again. I decided right then that I really wanted to see the end of this game. As terrifying as these levels could sometimes be, I had to beat them to get through. I decided that no matter what happened, no matter what the game showed me, I was going to get to the end. And I also made sure not to say a damn word while playing a chase level from here on. For this chase, I tried out Angiris, since his roll attack allowed me to move faster than Godzilla or Mothra. The chase started off like the first two, except there was a river of blood below the ground. I was beginning to get the hang of it, and the extra speed from the roll helped me get an edge on the red monster, especially since I didn't have to worry about a power limit and could keep rolling endlessly. Like the previous levels with water, the ground inevitably reached a stop, so I rolled off into the blood. To my surprise, the Hellbeast didn't follow after me, it just stopped on the edge of the ground and grimaced. I guess it can't swim, I thought to myself. So I went under blood and continued moving. There wasn't anything around, but I knew something was up. The chase wasn't going to end that easily, could it? Surely something else had to show up. And sure enough, I heard the bellowing roar, sounding slightly different and the monster was following after me in a new aquatic body. I had no idea it was a shapeshifter. After it reappeared, the chase started to get into the difficulty I had expected. Being submerged slowed me down, putting me and the beast at about the same speed. The only thing that could keep me alive was fast thinking and reflexes. I encountered some bottomless pits, in which mines floated up from. I assumed that if you hit one, it would damage you and knock you back. Considering how fast the red monster swims, hitting the mines would be instant death, so I went through great effort to avoid them. But that wasn't all I had to be wary of. Halfway through the chase, the Hell Beast revealed yet another surprise. A tentacle formed of intestine and tipped with a clawed set of jaws burst from its mouth, trying to pull me in and devour me. I only barely avoided both the tentacle and the mines, and I could tell the beast was getting desperate because the chase was nearly over. And about a minute later, I had spotted a bit of ground that served as the exit. I leaped with all the might I could muster without breaking my controller. The beast screamed with rage and jumped out of the blood river in one last attempt to drag me down, but I escaped its grasp this time. I fell back on my bed and took a deep breath. Satisfied with yet another successful escape. Now I was headed to the fifth world. Entropy. In the original game, the sixth world was Pluto. Ironically, despite being the smallest planet, 
Pluto was the largest and most diverse world in the game. Entropy had a different layout, but was similarly huge and diverse. Strangely, none of the levels from the previous worlds were present here. Instead, there were eight brand new icons. The bosses this time were Megalon, Batra, and Mechagodzilla. As usual, the first thing I did was go to the quiz level for another interrogation from Face. But when I got there, I noticed something different. Instead of the usual goofy music, it was the password theme. The music change seemed to be intentional, because after the first two questions at the start, the quiz started to take on a darker tone. Do you like ice cream? Yes. Weird face number one. Do you like clowns? Yes. Weird face number 10. Is time slipping through your fingers? Yes. Weird face number 2. Do you have any regrets? Yes. Hurt. Do some people deserve to die? No. Weird face number 3. Is it safe to go out at night? Yes. Weird face number 5. Do you find it hard to sleep at night? Yes. Weird face number 9. Have you ever killed anyone? No. Weird face number 7. Do you want to kill anyone? No. Angry. Are you actually accomplishing anything? No. Weird face number 4. Does life have any real meaning? No. Love. Do you like Mothra? No. I knew that last one was going to be a gameplay-related question, but I had no idea what the result would be. I answered honestly because, as I said before, I never liked Mothra. Nobody liked playing as Mothra in this game, and there was a good reason for that. Every time Mothra gets hit, she gets slammed back to the left corner of the screen, and she sucks at fighting because her attacks are so weak. The only benefit Mothra had was being able to fly over obstacles in some levels. So I answered no, and Face actually replied back to me. Not only with a maniacal expression, but with the text, Too bad. I was taken back to the map screen, and I was shocked to see that Godzilla and Anguirus had disappeared from the board, leaving only Mothra. Face had just fucked me over. Needless to say, I was pissed. But there wasn't anything I could do. I'm willing to bet even if I said yes, I would have been stuck with Mothra anyway. Face giveth, and face taketh away. I took a deep breath and got ready to explore. There were two paths I could take through the board. I decided to take the lower one. This turned out to be a good choice for reasons I'll get into momentarily. The first world ahead of me was a forest, so I started there. Almost immediately, I got an eerie feeling. There was something about this level that just seemed off to me, even more than the previous ones. Maybe it was the pitch black background. I've always been afraid of being in a forest at night. Something about all those trees makes me feel surrounded and vulnerable. And the fact that I was stuck as Mothra didn't help. Playing the game's previous worlds as Godzilla gave me a feeling of bravery. Being in control of the King of the Monsters, I'd be able to handle just about anything in my way. But it's not like that with Mothra. No feeling of strength or security. Now I'm just a weak, easily overwhelmed bug, traversing into the unknown. After a while, I encountered the first enemies of the stage. Or at least I assumed they were enemies. They were strange, long-legged, deer-like creatures. Instead of attacking, they were just idly walking around. I went to approach them, and they ran away. I thought about shooting one with an eye beam to see what would happen, but it seemed wrong. These creatures were harmless. So I passed over them and continued through the level. About halfway through, I encountered groups of deer-like animals and also two new creatures. A sloth-like creature with a beak climbing on a tree, and hairy raptor-esque beasts that were preying on the deer. 
It was very surreal watching these creatures interact. I didn't feel like I was playing a video game, but that I was traveling through a forest in some other dimension. The creatures ignored me for the most part, although the raptors did attack me when I got too close, or if I attacked them first. I know I shot one of them to help the deer creatures escape. I got clawed at, but the confrontation was easily avoided by flying to the top of the screen. After that, I had to choose whether I wanted to play the levels with the hourglass or the TV screen. I picked the latter. What I got was not at all what I expected. When I pressed the button to start a level on the TV screen like I normally would, the screen with an animation popped up. There was also music in the background, which was the Goofy Ghidorah music that used to be playing in the quiz levels. I was a little unsettled by this because it was just so strange. I also found it a bit spooky because I had a shirt that looked just like this when I was a kid. After starting the animation, you could go back to the board by pressing any button. After that, I had no idea what to expect for the rest of these icons. I went to try an hourglass icon next. I was somewhat relieved when an actual level came up. It was certainly an unorthodox looking level. All brown, with time measuring instruments floating in the air with gigantic grandfather clocks in the background. The music was the same as the board screen. And very early in the level I encountered something else I didn't expect to see. The original enemies from the game. And not just that, it seemed to be a whole fleet of them. I took some damage, but it was nothing I couldn't handle. But the most interesting thing about the level was the colored hourglass items. There were three of these. A blue hourglass that made time slow down and filled the level with enemies from the past. A red hourglass that made time speed up and filled the level with enemies from the future. And a green hourglass that set time to normal speed and filled the level with original game enemies. I encountered the blue hourglass first. As stated, the game started to slow down, and I saw the enemies from the past, which were five different types of prehistoric animals. I don't know much about prehistory, but I believe all of these enemies represent real animals. The level went into another segment, and I encountered the green hourglass, and then I fought the original enemies again. It was the same five types, so I didn't take any screenshots. But in the last segment, I encountered the red hourglass, and the enemies that must have been from the future. Now, whether or not the game was showing me 8-bit renditions of creatures that will actually exist thousands of years into Earth's future, I have no idea. But with that thought in mind, I found this particular segment to be very eerie. And it was made more tense because everything moved faster. One of the future enemies bore a striking resemblance to something I saw in a book once, called Truden Man. Another looked like some kind of organic spaceship. There was only one of the fifth type of future creature. When it appeared, all the others ran for their lives, leaving me alone to battle it. It could fly, but its sprite didn't actually move, and its single attack was firing a lightning bolt from its face. Even so, it was surprisingly powerful, and I suppose it could be considered a mini-boss. After defeating it, it left a health power-up that restored the energy and health that I had lost while fighting it. Which was convenient. It seemed I would need all the help I could get to beat this world with Mothra alone. After the previous stage, the next stage appeared to be a toxic waste dump. As you can see, the place looked grungy and inhospitable. The music was a short looping of an ambient synthesizer song. Listening to it made me feel like I had sniffed some toxic fumes myself, and it was messing with my head the whole time. The enemies all seemed to be mutated to some degree. In the above screenshot, you can see green mummies with bird skulls that jump out of the waste to spit projectiles. There's also a brownish cow skeleton monster with spider legs. Halfway through the level, I even saw one of the deer from the forest. It was alone, and when I saw it, it was drinking toxic waste out of a barrel with an anteater-like tongue. I was moving over it trying to make it stop, but then this flock of skull birds came out of nowhere and started attacking. The deer was scared by this and ended up running off the ground into the toxic waste. 
I feel bad for it. One of the birds hit me, but I regained health quick from killing all of them. They were pretty weak. I pressed onward. Of all the levels in Entropy, this was probably the most normal, in that there was little deviance from the move forward smash things formula in the original game. I encountered more creatures through the level, like tentacled blobs and some kind of deformed thing with human-like teeth. I didn't feel like provoking them into a fight, so I kept on flying near the top of the screen. I still had to deal with the occasional flock of birds every now and then. At the end of the level was a large bluish-green lake. There I encountered another mini-boss, some kind of a monster with a long neck and a whale skull. It attacks with a mouth projectile, and by charging into you. It could also go underneath the water and rapidly emerge from a different place. It was harder to beat than the boss from the time level, and it had a lot of health because it must have taken me three minutes to defeat it. It let out a really loud noise when it died, and then sank back into the water as I left the screen. Back on the board, I went to the nearest level icon I hadn't seen yet, which was a white tree. As I had guessed, the level was a winter-themed recolor of the forest stage. But unlike the regular forest, I didn't feel unnerved starting this one. I think the music had a lot to do with it. It was a gentle, calm song. It almost sounded romantic. It was quite stress relieving, and the forest itself looked much less ominous covered in snow. I traveled through the first segment enjoying the atmosphere for four minutes, when suddenly I realized something. I haven't seen a single creature since I started the level. Where are all the animals? Soon after, I left the screen, and the next segment started. In the second segment, I was still in the winter forest, but now the music was gone. I was starting to feel suspicious, but then I reminded myself that there were other empty levels in this game, and this was likely another one of those. But then, I heard something familiar. It was the music from Unforgiving Cold starting up. I could feel my heart sink as I came across this horrible sight. It was a whole group of dead deer creatures covered in snow, Judging from the blackish-blue tone of their skin, they must have all frozen to death. On closer inspection, some were missing body parts. Now I was frightened, but I still had to keep going. Before exiting the level, I was really hoping to see something resembling the previous forest animals in a living state. And sure enough, I did. It was a creature much like the beaked sloth, except this thing had white fur, and was more of a beaked gorilla. It was walking very slowly when I saw it, but I was at least happy to see something alive. However, it didn't stay that way for long. A pack of raptors, who must have sensed that something else was still alive, came rushing in from the right side of the screen. The beaked gorilla didn't stand a chance, as one of the raptors immediately lunged at it and ripped open its back legs. These winter raptors acted far different from their temperate relatives. While the other raptors only attacked when hunting or when provoked, the winter raptors seemed to have all gone insane. They attacked everything in sight. One was running back and forth clawing at nothing, and even the noises they made sounded different, more high-pitched and enraged. As I left this second segment, I even saw two raptors fighting to the death. They were both covered in injuries, and one of the raptors had been blinded in one eye. I took a screenshot, but I didn't stay to see who won the fight. I only had to get through one more segment before I could get back to the board screen. But in this segment, I was no longer in the winter forest, but instead a very empty grassy plain, with a bright grey moon in the sky. The music from the winter forest part 1 had returned and immediately I started to feel dread. This is going to sound crazy, but it's the absolute truth. The game made this level from one of my memories. After a long stretch of nothing, I reached a lake, and then the moon moved down from the sky and began to hatch like an egg. When it did, a curled up humanoid figure fell into the lake as the moon halves quickly disintegrated. 
I heard a splash when it hit the water, then a moment of silence. Then the screen began to shake, and a new creature emerged from the water. And thus I was introduced to a monster I call the Moon Beast. This was the only screenshot I took, as I was focusing all my concentration on winning the fight. And it was the most difficult fight yet. Stronger than any of the previous bosses, this creature would have been hard to take down with Godzilla. And with Mothra, it seemed nearly impossible. I suppose I would consider myself fortunate that this beast lacked any attacks like Gigant saw, because if it had, I would never have won this. I barely had three bars of health when I finally killed this abomination, but what happened afterward is hardly what I could call a reward. I've been trying to keep my promise and suppress this memory for years, but it seems as if I have to get it off my chest. This is a painful memory for me, but the game already knows about it, and I think you should too. I'll just tell you the important parts because I don't like bringing this experience back into my head unless I have to. Back when I was in middle school, I had a girlfriend named Melissa. She suffered from some kind of mental disorder that caused her to go into episodes. When she was in an episode, she would stand or sit perfectly straight and still, and her face would instantly lose any expressions she had before. She would speak very clearly without any hint of emotion. When it was over, she would start trembling and sometimes bury her face in her hands and remain silent for several minutes. I can't really convey the feeling it gave me in words, and I won't try. You had to see this in person to understand. But despite this, she was a very kind person and I cared about her dearly. We liked to hang out in a field at night and look at the stars. But one night, she didn't say anything to me at all. She just stared directly at the moon, trembling. I tried to talk to her, but she suddenly sprung up and ran right into traffic. I tried to stop her, but I was too late. She got hit by a truck, and was killed. I know that the game knows about this, because after I defeated the moon beast, this happened. After that, I went back to the board screen. It was all I could do to not burst out screaming, and my hands were shaking so bad I could barely hold the controller. I knew the game was going to test me if I kept playing, but I had no idea it would go so far, or that it was even capable of doing what it just did. I could feel my brain going haywire as I asked myself, did the game just read my mind? That didn't seem possible. But what other explanation was there? It was then that I could no longer deny what now seemed obvious. This game is alive. And not only that, it can also establish some kind of mental connection with the player. And yet, I couldn't convince myself to stop playing. I don't know if it was the game messing with my mind or just my stubborn curiosity, but even with the previous revelation, I really wanted to see this through to the end, even more than I did before I beat Dementia. Terrifying as it might be, even dangerous, I knew that if I quit playing, I would never be able to stop thinking about it. If I tried to restart the game, it might go back to being normal again. How many people ever get to witness something like this firsthand, let alone be able to take screenshots of the whole thing? Fucked up as it was, this was the experience of a lifetime. But even so, I couldn't take any chances with my health. I had the TV remote right next to me, ready to turn the TV off in case I felt I was in actual danger. And if that didn't work, I would pull the plug out of the wall, or just run out of the room. Surely that would be enough. Whatever powers the game has, it seems to be confined to what it can show on the TV and whatever its mental connection could do. The latter was what worried me. 
I still didn't know what I was dealing with, so I wasn't about to underestimate it. And speaking of TVs, there was a TV screen icon right below the white forest that I had just left, and because the first animation was so bizarre, I figured I'd try another one to see what happens. Although I expected the same animation, I actually got a totally different one. Weird. The music for this one was the Neptune board music. Fitting, I suppose, since it's a fishman and all. I can't help but wonder what the point of these things are. There was one more TV screen icon, so I figured it must have a unique animation of its own. I was going to make sure to see what it was before I left Entropy. But then it was time for another level. The gold brick icon was the closest thing, so I went to that and started up a gold labyrinth level. My health and power were refilled. Not sure how or why, but I was glad not to be heading into the unknown nearly dead. I also noticed that my Mothra sprite had shrunk to about half its original size. The gold labyrinth was an anomaly. I'm not sure how this level would have played out if I was using Godzilla or Anguirus, because flying seemed necessary just to get around this place. Another thing that caught my attention was that when you go left, your monster actually turns and faces to the left. That sounds stupidly obvious, but in the original game, you were only supposed to move to the right, and when you tried to move left, your monster ended up walking backwards. This level was apparently gigantic in size, because every time I thought I reached the end of it, or thought I was going to end up back where I started, I encountered something totally new. Things like lava blockades, new enemies, and statue faces. And I found one statue face at a dead end with a wide, open-eyed stare. The night Melissa died, she had an expression on her face that was similar to this the whole time. Even when she got hit by the truck, she still had that same expression. I can't help but feel like something really is staring at me from behind the screen when I look at this. I really didn't want to be reminded of that night anymore, so I left the statue almost as soon as I found it. I needed to find the exit anyway, which proved to be no simple task. It felt like this level stretched on forever in all directions. I must have wandered around that level for at least 15 minutes before I finally saw something. It was a creature that wasn't gold, seemingly the only one of its kind in the level. Lacking any kind of hover ability like the other creatures, it just walked back and forth on the platform. But it wasn't long after I found it that a flying machine swooped down and grabbed it, and then flew off with it. Apparently it hadn't seen me, so I decided to follow it and see where it was taking the creature. The machine stopped in a room with a large cauldron-like object in the center. It hovered over to the cauldron and dropped the creature into it. The creature eventually emerged from a hole in the cauldron's side, now adorned in the same gold color as everything else. The machine flew off. I'm not really sure what to make of this, but I'm glad I came upon it, because I found the exit soon after. When I got back to the board, I realized that the bosses hadn't moved at all. A bit odd, but it didn't really bother me. It just made planning my route through Entropy easier. There were still two new icons to explore, Indigo Cliffs and a black version of the Labyrinth. Since there were only three black Labyrinth icons which were surrounded by bosses, I played the Indigo Cliffs first. It was a lot like the blue and green mountain levels. The graphics had that same shredded look to it. One of the first things I encountered were these multicolored creatures with big heads emerging from a small cave in the ground. They all made a synchronized shaking sound, and they walked to the right in a big group after emerging from the cave, ignoring me. Having no other way to go, I followed them on their route. More and more emerged from the cave until the group had about a hundred creatures. Eventually, the pathway ended in a cliff. I was shocked to see that upon reaching the cliff, all the creatures began jumping off into the abyss. I've seen enemies walk off cliffs before in other games, but I've never seen them commit mass suicide like this. Very unsettling way to start off a level. I continued on, flying over various strange animals like the ones shown here. Another group of multicolored bobbleheads was jumping up and down, only to be snatched up by large birds which I'm fairly certain are sprite versions of the giant condor from Godzilla vs. the Sea Monster. I defeated some of the condors in battle, but it bothered me that these bobbleheads seemed to be so eager to die. If the game itself is alive, 
Perhaps the creatures in these levels are also alive? And some have very unhappy lives if this behavior is any indication. But what provokes them to do this? At the end of the level, I saw yet another group of bobbleheads marching up to a large monster and being devoured. This was starting to disgust me, so acting on impulse, I fired off eye beams at both the monster and the bobbleheads. I destroyed the cave. The monster got angry and ran through the remaining bobbleheads to fight me. Although it lacked any ranged attacks, it was relentless, but it was no match for me. I was in the home stretch now, up to the bosses. My plan was to go through Batra first, then Megalon. After that, I would watch the last TV screen and play the Black Labyrinth before fighting Mechagodzilla. And lastly, going through the chase with the Hell Beast. I was curious to see if it would have a new form again. But first things first, time to beat up Batra. As I expected, he started off in his larval form. Whenever the game puts in a new Godzilla Kaiju with more than one form, that other form always shows up. For a game that's otherwise inexplicable, it's rather startling in its consistency and accuracy with the kaiju bosses. The fight started off simple. Larva Batra fought in a similar fashion as Maguma did, charging back and forth and occasionally firing off lightning from its horn. Fighting Imago Batra was much like fighting a clone Mothra, although Batra was distinctly faster and stronger. Although it lacked the horn lightning, it now had a new, more powerful eye beam. Batra could change direction just like I could, so this battle involved a lot of flipping and flying around. It was pretty damn fun, to be honest. So after beating Batra, I was excited to see what Megalon would be like. But first I went through another Indigo Cliffs level and shot through a bunch of creatures for the health power-ups. So about Megalon. His music was the Gigan's theme. Makes sense since Gigan was his battle partner in Megalon's one, and so far only, film appearance. He was a lot like Mogira, but faster and with more weapons. He'd start out charging off with his drills. I liked to fly back and forth around him, which really seemed to annoy him. After a few seconds, he'd step back, turn around and start spitting out grenades. Those were a pain because they bounce when they hit the ground. Lastly, he started spamming his lightning beam, which only went straight forward. So it was pretty easy to duck under it and then shoot him with my eye beams. Overall, I'd describe him as strong, persistent, but dumb. I was getting close to the end of Entropy. I'd just taken down Megalon and I started up the last TV screen to see what I would get this time. The result was... unpleasant. The music for this gruesome scene was the password theme. I couldn't figure out why this animation was so sinister and violent in comparison to the other two. The whole game seemed to be growing more malevolent. As I went on to finish Entropy, I began to feel... drained. It's hard to describe. It was like I had suddenly became tired when I wasn't before. Most likely it was just the tension from all that had happened in this game getting to me, but who knows. The last level type on Entropy is what I call the Shadow Labyrinth. The scenery was recolored from gold to black, the music was my first sign that this level was going to be distressing. I traveled through the maze for about a minute, and I noticed there weren't any creatures hovering around. It was an odd transition from the gold labyrinth, which was overrun with creatures. But then this might be a good thing. Maybe there wouldn't be any obstacles and I could just get through the level. Then the screen went dark, and immediately I snapped out of my daze from a few seconds earlier. Everything had been darkened so that the only thing I could see was the Mothra sprite. I couldn't tell where I was going and I ended up frantically running into walls. I heard a noise. It was like the sound of a crowd running through a hallway. And along with the running came the roars. Loud roaring sounds which I would describe as something like a rabid dog the size of an elephant. And I could tell that whatever was making this noise, there were lots of them. I knew there was something there, but it wasn't until I did some screen cap editing that I got to see what my pursuers looked like. But at the time, I couldn't see where they were, or where I was going. I was literally running blind, and this mob of beasts eventually caught up with me. All I could think was, NO! as I saw my life bar rapidly declining. The monsters had taken me down to about half of my total health, when I was saved. The light came back on, and the attackers had disappeared. 
and so the challenge of this level was revealed. Find the exit before the lights go out and a pack of monsters maul you to death. I was in panic mode now, moving as fast as I could go while trying every path I could find for a way out. As I played through the level, the lights went out a total of three times. The second time, I would have been dead meat had it not been for one of those wide-eyed statues. When I stayed close to it, the monsters seemed to all avoid me until the light came back. The statue warded them away somehow. I was safe as long as I stayed near it, but at the same time I had to leave to find the exit. The Shadow Labyrinth turned out to be much smaller than the Gold Labyrinth, as it only took about six minutes to navigate to the end. But before the exit, there was a row of halls leading straight down, with no way out once entered. You either got to the exit before the monsters reached you, or you died. Thankfully, I made it out. Only one more boss, Mecha Godzilla. I started the battle and got something unexpected. Instead of a replacement boss, I was fighting Godzilla. But any Godzilla fan worth their salt can figure this out. Mecha Godzilla started off like fighting a clone Godzilla, but his disguise burned away after only three life bars. Usually a transformation only occurs at the halfway point. At this point, it was like fighting Mecha Godzilla in the normal game. Felt kinda nice to fight one of the original game enemies for a change. Although he wasn't exactly like normal, he also had a rainbow beam and finger missiles. This prevented me from doing the old trick of backing him in the corner and hitting him with eye beams in a spot where he can't hit me, but that was always a cheap trick anyways. But after getting him down to half his health, something weird started to happen. His sprite started to glitch, in much the same way as Gizora had way back in the first world. After a few seconds, the glitches started to form a new shape and thus the game had created not Mecha Godzilla, And I figured that this visual glitch was somehow related to the game recreating things. The human face on this one gives it a very uncanny look. It was one of the stronger replacement monsters, and had the most firepower. Pictured here is its mouth beam, which I got caught in the middle of. Even though it was a bit stronger, it was also slower than its original counterpart and couldn't jump around as much. I won the fight by constantly staying out of its line of fire, bombarding the machine with poison powder as I flew over it. One last thing to do. The Hellbeast chase. Oh boy. Might as well just get this over with, I thought. The entropy end chase ended up being exactly what I was afraid it would be. A labyrinth level. All the other chases, although difficult, were extremely straightforward. You just had to run to the end and not get touched. But this took all the simplicity out of it. There was no telling how big this labyrinth would be, or where the exit was. And not only did I have to constantly backtrack to find my way out, I had to get avoid getting one hit killed by the red monster. And for those first 30 seconds, it didn't show up. But I knew it would, and as I started picking up the pace, I heard a loud flapping noise. And there it was, in a flying form. It had new bat-like wings, and was fast and relentless as ever. For reasons already stated, this was probably the most nerve-wracking of all the end chases. And as such, I had to keep my focus on the game and not take as many screen caps. However, I did take this one of the red monster doing something I found interesting. I had managed to lose it by going through a different path than it apparently expected, and it was blocked from attacking me by one of these walls, or so I thought. It tried clawing through the wall for a second before opening up its mouth and tearing the wall apart with the intestine jaws. But those brief milliseconds that the monster was held back might have just been the key to me finding the exit. The path to the exit was long and complex, but from what I remember I went up and then I went back towards the left. I'm not sure why I chose that particular way. Just a lucky hunch I suppose. I was sweating profusely, but my luck had saved me yet again. I hoped that it wouldn't run out before I finished the game. There were only two more worlds to go. Next was the penultimate world, called Extus. In the brief instant before the transition between Entropy and Extus, I was hoping that I would get Godzilla and Anguirus back. As the board appeared, I saw that my wish was half granted. I had Godzilla back, but no Anguirus. I would have preferred both, but despite Anguirus's neat abilities, I probably would have chosen Godzilla if I had to pick between the two. 
Exodus had two different colored temples, white and pink, a pyramid, what looked like some modern buildings, and two other icons that I couldn't figure out at the time. The new bosses were Komunga, Gorosaurus, and not Ghidorah, who I was dreading to see, let alone fight. With Godzilla back, I was excited again and eager to explore, yet still cautious. I went to the quiz level first, just like before. This time, Face's questions were more random than ever. Do elephants breathe? Yes. Weird face number two. Have you ever been molested by your family member? No. Weird face number six. Have you ever raped anyone? No. Weird face number eight. Is green your favorite color? No. Weird face number ten. Is the computer the pinnacle of modern technology? Yes. Weird face number four. Are you a tough guy? Yes. Weird face number twelve. Can you fly? No. Weird face number nine. Can you stand on your head? Yes. Weird face number seven. Do you hate raccoons? No. Confused. Do you feel blame? No. Weird face number 11. Would you like a new monster? Yes. Surprised. Will you miss me? Yes. Sad. I was happy that I was getting a new monster, but that last question bothered me. Will you miss me? Is face referring to when I finish the game? Since the revelation of the game's truly otherworldly nature, I wasn't sure what to think of Face, or anything else in the game. But something about that last statement gave me a genuine feeling of sadness from Face. As I was thinking about this, the game had gone back to the board. I had a new monster, but I had no idea who it was supposed to be. The sprite had a slight resemblance to Rodan, but the head was totally off. I moved this mysterious newcomer to a white temple icon and started the level. This screen appeared with the text, Find the Gem, presumably instructions for beating the level. After that, I got my first look at the new playable monster. Some kind of hairy, dark blue creature with bat wings and a skull-like face named Solomon. I also found that my path was blocked by a beam of light, and a small pillar with a plate on it. I figured that this beam of light was blocking the exit, so I have to find the gem and drop it on the plate to deactivate the beam. How exactly I was going to do that, I didn't know. There wasn't anything in the original game requiring you to find an item to beat a level. I'd have to find out when I obtained the gem. The only direction I had to go was left, so on I proceeded. Solomon was an interesting monster to say the least. He was capable of both flight and a heat beam, both of which proved to be very useful. He could also kick and slash with his wings, but he couldn't duck. It wasn't long before I started running into waves of strange new enemies. They did little to stop me, I just ran past them all slashing and didn't take any damage. There was a pause between each wave of enemies. After you had killed about 10, there wouldn't be any for about a minute, then the next wave would appear. After 5 minutes, I noticed holes in the floor and ceiling. Guillotine mouthed creatures were rapidly flying up and down these crevices so I had to time my jumps carefully because I didn't know if I'd get another shot at this. Luckily, I managed to get through without a scratch. I'm just lucky, I guess. After that, I found myself at the end of the hallway, facing some kind of mini-boss monster. It moved fast and had a projectile that shot in four directions, but I killed it pretty easily using Solomon's heat beam. When the battle was over, I had my gem, which was inside the creature's head. I found that I could pick up the gem by walking over to it and holding down B. I made the long trek back to the start and deposited the gem on the plate, which deactivated the beam. I left the stage and was shown what was probably the strangest quirk relating to the Solomon monster. Every time you complete a stage or defeat a boss with Solomon, this screen appears. I have no idea what still the best 1973 means. Neither the date or the phrase has any meaning or significance to me that I can think of, 
and I've spent a lot of time thinking about it. The next level I played was one that I call Bronze Pyramids. I used Godzilla, and found that he had been leveled up to 12 since I last played as him in Dementia. The Bronze Pyramids were fairly normal as these levels go, but the visuals were pretty interesting. Almost unusually colorful and lively. The music had a fittingly Egyptian style to it. It was slow and mysterious sounding. I strolled through the level fighting off the various enemies. None were too difficult, although the ants could be a pain if you ran into too many at once. My favorite enemy was this giant reptile I encountered halfway through. At the end of the level I came to a giant pyramid and engaged in yet another mini-boss fight. Although this one was a bit different because I had to fight two of these monsters at the same time. Individually I could have dealt with them easily, but fighting both of them at once was challenging. But I sped things up by tricking one of the twin beasts into barbecuing his brother by jumping when he uses the flame breath. I wanted to try out Solomon some more, so I moved his piece over to one of the brown pillar looking icons with colored dots and started the level. When I got to the level, I then realized what the icon represented. Totem poles. I was greeted by two of them at the very beginning. I walked around for three minutes with nothing else in sight besides the totem poles. I didn't realize it until then, but I wasn't expecting another level with nothing alive in it after all the activity and entropy. Walking by all those multicolored faces, this unnerving level left me feeling like I was being watched. Only about 10 minutes after I started Exodus, I was already halfway through. After getting back from the totem pole level, I tried out one of the TV screens to see how strange they were this time. Even more strange than before, apparently. I switched back to Godzilla to play another level, and this one was actually quite a surprise. It was a normal city level. The colors were gloomy, but even still, this was quite a shock. This was the kind of level I would expect to see in a Godzilla game, and I was kind of mad that I didn't get to play it earlier. The music was the Earth theme. I found it pretty strange that a level fitting a Godzilla game would show up this late, but there's no point crying over spilled milk, I suppose. I moved Solomon over to a grayish-green icon which turned out to be a giant high-tech laboratory of some sort. Lots of mechanical drones in this level, but Solomon cleared through them just like with the white temple enemies. I noticed these large stasis tanks holding some kind of monster inside. As you would guess, sometimes the monsters awaken and shatter through the glass. I tried to get past the stasis tanks as fast as possible, because the monsters inside proved to be vicious little bastards upon release. At the end of the level was an elevator, which I used to go down to the bottom of the level where the exit was. Along the way I was shot at by security drones. I couldn't leave the elevator, so my only defense was the heat beam. The last level type was a simple thing that I call the Heart Temple, for obvious reasons. Nothing but a big hallway filled with floating enemies shaped like human hearts. They're incapable of causing you damage, so what you do is run through the level smashing as many as you can to get all the power-ups. One run through these levels would get the life meter back up to full, and I would greatly appreciate these levels later. The Heart Temple's music reminded me of a circus tune, and had an overly cheerful sound to it which gave the level a very weird feeling. Having seen all the level types, I chose to fight Gorosaurus using Solomon. It was during this fight that I realized Solomon is overpowered. A single well-aimed slash can take down as many as four of the enemy's life bars. Due to this, the fight was over very quickly. Gorosaurus had no projectile attacks or anything else that could match Solomon's deadly claws. But I kept the fight going just long enough to see if Gorosaurus would use his iconic kangaroo kick. And I was greatly pleased when he did. Even though I knew Solomon was my fighting ace, I used Godzilla to battle Kumonga just for variety. Kumonga was also a simple opponent, no heat beams or anything. He attacks by jumping on you, stabbing with his mandibles, and also uses his signature webbing string to paralyze you. Once you get webbed, Kumonga will sometimes take the opportunity to attack, but it's mostly a way to buy some time, like Gizora backing you in the corner until the time runs out. With Gorosaurus and Kumonga defeated, I was at the end of Exodus. Before I fought not Ghidorah, there was something I had to do. 
I wasn't expecting much from it, but for documentation's sake, I took a look at the other TV screen. This is what it was. I don't think there ever was much reason behind the TV screens. If I were to guess, I'd say it's some random, uncontrolled manifestation of the cartridge's abilities. Or maybe this all makes perfect sense to the game. Who knows? It was time for the opponent I had been dreading. Not Ghidorah. Although I had gained some courage from Solomon's combat advantages, I was still nervous. And when I started the fight, I was immediately confused. My opponent was not Gizora. I defeated it with a few strikes, and then not Mogira appeared. Then it made sense. In order to get to not Ghidorah, I had to battle all the previous replacements first. And battle them I did. I tore my way through them until I finally made it to not Ghidorah, who was... a Dorat. Once I stopped laughing, I destroyed him with only two slashes. The music stopped and I thought I was going back to the board, but the battle wasn't over yet. The real fight was against the Chimera, a monstrous hybrid of all the replacement beasts. This was by far the most difficult boss yet. Every attack of his would cut down whole life bars per use, while attacks against him were greatly weakened. Solomon's Slash, for example, was now lucky to take away one half a life bar. During this battle, I gained a great appreciation for two things. The boss fight time limit, and the heart temple. Had it not been for those things, I might have never beaten this boss. To take down this behemoth, I came up with a strategy. I would switch between Godzilla and Solomon, and as one began to get dangerously low on health, I would take him through the Heart Temple while fighting Chimera with the other. I should count my blessings that Chimera couldn't regain lost health. A very interesting thing about Chimera was that each body part effectively had its own life meter. The head was invincible as long as the other parts were present, so it would have to be the last part to be destroyed. In addition to being difficult, it was also the longest fight so far. I tried to remember how many times I had got taken out of the fight by the timer, but I lost count around 13. Eventually, I had destroyed all components but the head, which now flew around on its own at an incredible speed. Chimera fought well, but I was extremely determined and once he was reduced to a head, he no longer had the power to defeat Solomon. So I heat beamed him into oblivion. And then Chimera was no more. I was exhausted after that drawn out fight, and worried that it might affect my performance in the end world chase level. The headquarters icon was replaced, but not by the Hellbeast face. Instead, it was a crucifix. I wasn't excited about seeing the Hellbeast icon again, but if there was only one good thing about those levels, it's that they were predictable. I had a basic idea of what to expect. But now, here I was at the end, and the icon was completely different. What did it mean? And why a crucifix? It made me very uneasy. I attempted to start the level with Solomon, but I couldn't. I just got this notice that simply stated, Solomon can't enter here. It didn't say why, but I think maybe it has to do with Solomon's demonic appearance. Since Solomon was out of the question, I went with Godzilla instead. Once I saw the level, the crucifix made sense. The level was a graveyard. I was still on edge, thinking this was some kind of trick. The last level had always involved running from the demonic beast, and I wasn't going to be fooled into thinking this would be any different. So I started out running. But after a minute without interruption, I slowed down. It was during this time that the music caught my attention. I knew it sounded familiar when I first heard it, but it took a while before I realized what it was. An 8-bit rendition of Prayer for Peace from the first Godzilla film. A very sad, powerful song, even in this form. At two minutes into the level, I encountered something that I wasn't sure how to react to. My first instinct was to run, but this blue, statuesque being simply floated in place, and I felt compelled just to stare at it for a time. Since this was a grave, and it was floating over a chapel, I guessed that this was some kind of angel watching over the deceased. It gave me a strange but warm feeling. I wouldn't say happy, but I felt that I was at peace somehow. 
I had never seen this being before, yet it seemed very familiar to me. Just as I was going to leave, the Hell Beast appeared. Its presence warped the music into a terrifying discordant screeching and transformed the level, desecrating the tombstones as a new ground appeared, comprised of blood-soaked bodies. I could feel my heart now beating out of control. I had no chance of escape with the monster that close. It lunged for the kill, but the angel got in its way. The demon roared and started clawing through the angel's leg, and tears of blood streamed from its eyes. I wanted to save the angel, but there was nothing I could do. I had to honor its sacrifice and run, and so I ran through the hellish landscape as fast as I could. The beast soon caught up with me, still swallowing the body of the angel whose legs it had torn off. And this sight made my terror change into anger. I now found myself hating this monster. There was no doubt in my mind that it was pure evil, and I wanted it to die. When I got to the end, I remembered how it responded to my insult in trance. I spoke to it and said, You're going to pay. And this was its response. I had no idea how I would follow up on that threat. And nothing could have prepared me for the horrors of the final world. Zenith. And here we are, at the final world. I don't like to discuss this part, and it still bothers me a lot. But it's something I have to do, so I can put all of this behind me. People deserve to know. At this point I was well aware of the game's unnatural nature, but Zenith was different than the other worlds. While the others were certainly strange, and sometimes frightening, the world of Zenith was like a nightmare and I didn't have to go any further than the board screen for an indication that something was wrong with Zenith. The first thing I noticed was the blood-red texture of the board, and the music, which was an eerie whistling tune. I noticed that I had Solomon and Anguirus back, and I felt better for a second. Then I scrolled over to the right to see who my enemies would be this time. This time it was Destroya and Ghidorah, but judging from the icon it was a different Ghidorah than the original standing on the ground instead of flying. The grotesquely detailed pinkish-red icon also caught my eye. I couldn't tell what it was supposed to be, and I was afraid to find out. Going back to my side of the board, I decided there wasn't much choice but to do my usual routine in going to the quiz level before doing anything else. I was not ready for what happened. I jumped back when this appeared, accompanied by a terribly distorted version of the password theme. It looked as if Face had fallen victim to some terrible glitch. Is this what he meant by, will you miss me? Did he know this would happen? My thoughts were stopped short as I noticed the screen was glitching and seemingly falling apart while I was inactive, so I quickly rushed out. And when I got back to the board, I somehow gained a new monster. I hadn't even been asked if I wanted one. I tried to select it, and this happened. What the hell is going on? The game's behavior was scaring me, and I hadn't even started the levels yet. I couldn't understand why I was randomly given a new character and then denied use of it, but for the time being there was little that could be done, and I viewed the last TV screen. No animation. No music. Dead. Every instinct I had was telling me to stop playing, to just turn the game off. And something in the game itself might have been trying to warn me as to just how horrible this last world was. But then, every stretch of the way I was compelled to give up. I couldn't do that now, on the last world. Besides, after taunting me with memories of Melissa, I felt the game owed me some answers. I noticed that this first level was a red temple so I was at least familiar with the level graphics, if nothing else. And I went in with Godzilla, the monster I was most familiar with. Godzilla had been shrunk, the level and score meters had vanished, and the blue temple faces were back. The music was similar to the blue temple also. I tried to get my spirits up by thinking, well, if this level is like the blue temple, then that might mean there are no enemies to deal with. 
how wrong I was. After a short walk, all the statue's eyes started glowing, and a pack of beasts from the Shadow Labyrinth came charging into me. Since they were coming from the right of the screen, I had to fight my way through them. This battle greatly tested my reflexes, but thanks to my speed I plowed through the beasts. They gave off health power-ups after dying, which helped recover the damage they had given me. However, as I continued through the hallway, the statue's eyes glowed again, summoning another wave. It seemed to be the same number of them, but I was less prepared this time, and took more damage. I had gone through four of these waves until I reached the end of the hall, where I heat-beamed the last of the monsters over the edge into an abyss. At first it seemed I had reached a dead end, but after the statue's eyes stopped glowing, a brick path slowly appeared before me. I followed the path, which kept me moving towards the right until it stopped at a wall, where I was to go vertically by jumping up the ledges. Along the way I encountered new creatures, and some sort of shrine, which had a statue of the Hell Beast and some other creature I don't recognize. As I went through, the path took a downward direction. I had to carefully aim my jumps to avoid the enemies, which were plentiful in this part of the stage. They didn't have many attacks, but they could easily shove you over the edge off a platform. At the end of this tunnel, there were a few small platforms floating above nothingness. I landed on one towards the left of the screen, and then something came down from above. It looked like the blue angel from the graveyard, except now it was red, and had a skull face. Any of the pleasant feelings I had from the blue angel were not present with this red one. And as it hovered around, its eye sockets started glowing just like the statues, summoning monsters to attack me. The battle was nerve-wracking. As I started off with nearly half my health and had to deal with multiple opponents, as well as the threat of gravity. To make things even worse, as the Red Angel took damage, some of the panels fell, until only three remained. But my luck had not run out yet. Just when I thought it was over, I struck the Red Angel one more time, and it turned out that one last hit was all it could take. Just as the Red Angel completely disintegrated, the game instantly went back to the Zenith board. I moved Mothra over to the nearest stage from the Red Temple, which seemed to be a garbled mess of letters spelling KILL, and began playing. As suspected, all the level graphics were made of jumbled letters, and Mothra, just like Godzilla, was shrunk to half size. I began to suspect that all the Zenith levels would be like this. The background music was terrible, like if someone put all the sounds an NES was capable of making into a blender and then piecing them back together into a song. I had to turn the volume down because of it. Playing as Mothra made avoiding the enemies easier, but they were nonetheless determined to get at me. The first enemies I saw were these headless Gigans, and later on there were hybrid monsters pieced together from previous bosses, like the Biolante headed thing seen above. Five minutes had gone by as I didn't see anything new, and the level shifted into another segment. The music changed from the loud and annoying beeps into something far more ambient and menacing. The level graphics also changed, now looking like a blood-drenched junkyard. The way everything in this level was red made it sickening to look at. The enemies multiplied in number, never ceasing to follow after me, and became harder and harder to avoid. At the end of the level, the situation reached a climax, as the swarms of monsters fused together into one enormous, terrifying hybrid. Once I had gotten through the initial shock, I discovered the way to destroy this thing, constantly shooting eye beams at the Hedora cluster that formed its heads. If you attacked anywhere else, it would regenerate the damage. Even with that knowledge, this was an extremely difficult fight. I'd say it was as hard as fighting the Moon Beast was, if not harder. Its most common attack was lunging forward with its arms, covered with Gigan saws and blades. If they touched, it would instantly drain health. When it was over, the remaining monsters collapsed into a heap, then they and the ground below them started to disintegrate and sink towards the bottom of the screen. When I came back to the board, I thought to myself, so far the game has been putting the easiest levels first. If that's the case, how bad will the rest of Zenith be? With two levels down and three to go, my monsters and I had taken our foothold in the world of nightmares that was Zenith. Deciding what action to take next was more tense and difficult than ever before but ultimately I had no way of knowing what the next levels would be like, or how well my monsters would be prepared for them, so my only option was to guess. I tried to interpret what the icons of the next levels ahead of me were. 
The last level before the boss battles was obviously representing some type of volcanic area with lava and open flames. The middle icon I still didn't get, except that it looked fleshy and vaguely like an organ of some kind. Oddly oversized as well. The one I was nearest to and about to enter next looked like thorny vines covering a puddle of blood. I guessed that this would be a level with blood rivers like the chase level of Dementia. As such, I went with Angiris, because due to his rolling move he would have the fastest speed while submerged. The level which I call Blood Lake looked like I expected. Rivers of blood accompanied by thorn-covered vines, which were scattered along the sides of the ground. I was disappointed to see that Angiris was shrunk just as Godzilla and Mothra had been. Apparently all the Zenith levels would be like this. I felt less secure with my giant monsters no longer so giant. I walked along without interruption for only a minute until my path reached a dead end. There was a massive gap between the ground I was walking on and the ground to the right of the screen. I would have swam across it and continued walking to the right, but due to the huge mass of brambles in the way, there was nowhere to go. Two creatures with gliding membranes on their arms and lamprey mouths were perched on the outstretched vines and screeching at me, much like a crow does to an invader of its territory. Another unnerving display of possible sentience by the creatures of this game, if it's even accurate to refer to them as being of the game, that is. I descended into the blood, slowly sinking to the floor. Aquatic enemies were everywhere, and they were hard to avoid. The black shark in particular was very aggressive and hard to deal with, but thankfully I only encountered one. As the scene became more and more crowded, I swam up to the surface, to find that it was littered with floating corpses. Creepy, but at least they're not a threat. Or so I thought, until they sprang to life and leaped on me. They were trying to pull me under, and they were draining my health as they did it. They all attacked as a group, and when I got one off me, another would jump on from behind. I had to curl up into a ball and roll for them to loosen their grip, and when they did, I quickly retreated. It wasn't long before I had reached another land path. A note regarding the brambles. You can stand on them, but it causes pain. And you can also destroy some of the vines, but only the thinner ones. I had to destroy multiple vines as well as dealing with more enemies. I was interrupted by a screen. This screen was up for about 30 seconds, then when it went back to the level I was facing another dead end, and a pregnant humanoid creature being hanged from the top right of the screen, by a spine or umbilical cord. Almost instantly the creature's belly was split open from the inside, and as the lower part of its body was ripped apart and fell into the river below, the Blood Lake's boss was revealed. It came flying towards me making a shrill hacking scream. I was forced to move back. The bat was a highly mobile boss, fast and difficult to hit. As I moved back along the ground, the monster opened its mouth and shot out a barrage of needles. I jumped over them and managed to give it a blow to the head and it started flying out of my reach. As the bat was flying, it shot a stream of fire from its eye sockets and started trying to hit me with the flames. I rolled along the ground which drained my power, but put us at equal speed. This cycle repeated around three times until the monster was defeated. With most of my health drained, I went back to the edge of the level, and a large bramble vine blocking the exit was now gone. Now only two levels left to go. Who to send this time? Godzilla, Mothra, and Angiris had all completed one level, leaving Solomon, and also the mysterious fifth monster. I tried again to access it, but with no luck. I chose to use Godzilla again for the next level, and Solomon for the final one. The second to last level was what I refer to as the organic level, which was the most visually unpleasant of them all. Right from the start I could see that the graphics were freakishly different. The atmosphere was gruesome and foreboding, with the addition of loud droning music. I was dreading what I would see in these levels, and it was only a few seconds before something appeared. Two hideous things. It's hard to describe most of this level. Everything had this disturbing, semi-real look to it. Most of the enemies look halfway between real animals and misshapen lumps of gore and teeth. It's also worth noting that all of them were considerably larger than Godzilla, and although the majority were not very intelligent, each of them took around 30 hits to kill. Due to this, it was a better idea to run away from them than fight but it was never clear exactly what direction to run to. While most levels involved going to the right and getting to the exit, 
The path of this level was primarily going down, by walking to the edge of one platform and jumping down to a lower one, nor any apparent means of getting back up to the higher platforms if necessary. Also, certain enemies acted as if they were aware you had to jump down, and would stand at the edge of the lower platform waiting for you. When this happened, I would have to walk back and wait until the monster would leave. As I went on, I came across platforms stacked above each other with little space in between, looking like a maze. This meant that I couldn't jump, and it made escape from enemies difficult. Thankfully, the only enemies able to fit through these mazes were those four-legged beasts seen at the beginning. Adding to the difficulty were long, tapeworm-esque monsters that would rise themselves up between the platforms and trap you. The only attack they responded to was the heat beam, which would cause them to shrink back down. But this was costing even more power, and I couldn't afford to do without the heat beam for long. While trying to avoid the abominations that dwell in this level, I found out that if you stand idle in one place for too long, the ground tries to absorb your monster. I think it was about four minutes before the end that this level was making me physically sick. The tension was getting to me, and having to take in all these disgusting sights made me want to puke. I nearly did pause the game and look for a bag, but I was able to hold it together. I also found a trick at the end of the level, though it was too late to do me any real good. If two different species of monster run into each other face to face, they would fight each other and leave me alone. I didn't intentionally cause this, it just happened. Finally at the end, it was time for another boss fight. It was certainly ugly, but not quite as horrific as I feared it would be. But more important than dealing with its appearance was defeating it. And since I had less than half my health bar to start with, there was no room for errors. It was attached to the floor when I first saw it, but after about 10 hits it detached from the floor and began floating. It moved fast, and unlike the Blood Lakes boss, it wasn't impeded by any sort of gravity. It was even able to fly through the ground without any collision effect. It used this to its advantage and would float beneath the ground and spring up randomly to bite at you, but it stopped doing this after a few well-aimed kicks to the face. The pink area on its upper jaw was a weak point. Too many hits there would cause it to spasm uncontrollably. Its new strategy was to rapidly float up and down while moving back and forth across the stage, trying to constantly keep its jaws aimed towards me. Health was getting critical at this point, so I spammed the heat beam, from which it had no defense. In the last stretch of the battle, the monster had lost its mind, rapidly rushing back and forth and gnashing its jaws. I had to duck under it and then strike when its back was turned. 20 more hits and it was destroyed. One last level to go. I didn't hesitate. I selected Solomon and entered, perhaps a little too fast. This last level was definitely the peak of the disconnect between what the NES was graphically capable of and what the game could create. The music also caught my attention. It was one of the only songs that appeared more than once. The horrible screeching from when the Hell Beast entered the graveyard. As soon as I started, there was already an enemy prepared to attack. A centaur wielding a whip. And it wasn't alone. When I started fighting, several more centaurs appeared, coming from both sides of the screen at the same time. It was too much to handle. Solomon's flight saved me from taking too much damage at the start of the level. The centaurs followed after, but seemed to be unable to jump. After escaping the centaurs, I noticed gaps in the ground. While trying to avoid the jumping sword-mouthed enemies in mid-flight, I got close to the surface of the lava, and a creature emerged and tried to grab me. It didn't succeed, but I was startled. Careful maneuvering would be needed to avoid instant death here. As more new enemies appeared, the level soon became very difficult. A lot of the trouble came from stocky red demons that stood on top of tall, narrow mountains and spewed fire. I got by them by waiting till their back was turned and hitting them with a flying kick, which made them fall into the lava. It was at this time I noticed that I wasn't gaining any health from killing enemies. Not all the ground was stable. At one point, the ground was reduced to small chunks that slowly drifted toward the right. Some of them would sink into the lava upon landing on them, and there was no way to tell which ones would sink and which ones would not. Being so close to the lava added the threat of the lava creatures, and this was very frustrating. I was also feeling hot, which made concentrating hard. If you've ever had a heat rash, it felt similar to that. I had to periodically stop for water because of it. 
This was almost certainly due to the game and not my imagination, but I kept pushing the thought out of my head. I didn't want to think about it. At the end of the stage, I encountered a boss rising from the lava. Its arrival noted with an ungodly howling roar. When it walked onto the land, I saw just how gigantic it was, several times the size of Solomon. I was about to fly up and attack it when it opened its mouth and let out a huge blast of fire. I had to fly to dodge the flames, and then get close enough to the boss to fire a heat beam at its face, causing it to stumble backwards. If it didn't stumble backwards, it would have kept moving left until it forced Solomon into the lava. The beast had to wait between uses of its fire breath, as it seemed to cost a great deal of energy. I used this time to attack it, but fire wasn't its only weapon. I had to be wary of the monster swatting at me with its clawed hands. As its health decreased, it moved faster, and the battle felt like a tug of war between the two monsters over this bridge of land. After about 40 hits, it was defeated, tumbling backwards into the lava from whence it came. And then, the final stage had been completed. At last, it was down to two bosses, and a final encounter with the Hell Beast. For some reason, I thought Ghidorah would be easier to beat, so I confronted him first. The classic Ghidorah battle music from the original started up as I faced against the new King Ghidorah. King Ghidorah was as powerful and unrelenting as ever. He instantly lashed out with gravity beams, which were more damaging than Godzilla's heat beam. It became a struggle of constantly beating Ghidorah at every opportunity to keep him from using the attack. But Ghidorah saw through my tactic, and started using physical attacks as well. He would strike out with each of his necks, knocking me backward and making it impossible to get close enough to punch him. But I had an idea, to wait for him to lunge with one of his heads and immediately blast it with the heat beam. It worked, and to my surprise, the heat beam actually obliterated Ghidorah's middle head. It was only a few seconds before I realized what this would lead to, and sure enough, King Ghidorah was using the power of the glitch to transform into Mecha King Ghidorah. Mecha King Ghidorah's first attack was its most deadly, the Machine Hand. Very similar to Gigant's Saw, it immobilizes the monster and rapidly drains the health bar. Fortunately, before Ghidorah could do a lot of damage, the timer ran out. I would need to defeat Mecha King Ghidorah quickly to prevent him from using the Machine Hand, so I sent Solomon to fight him. The two monsters were evenly matched in strength but Solomon was faster, and by slashing and heat beaming without pause, the cyborg monster soon met his end. With Ghidorah defeated, I was returned to the board. I now outnumbered the enemy by four monsters to one, and victory seemed to be soon at hand. The base icon had changed to a blood-red color. I could feel hatred emanating from it. I started the fight against Destroya with Anguirus, and the music was the same as Ghidorah's. When the fight began, Destroya was in microscopic form. After one hit, it changed into the Juvenile, which had few attacks and was also dealt with easily. The fight became serious once Destroya entered the aggregate form, gaining the use of large arms and the micro-oxygen beam. Anguirus's roll attack, which had been very useful up until now, was rendered useless by Destroya constantly attacking me with its large arms when I tried to use it. For this part of the fight, I had to rely on brute strength. Just before the time ran out, Destroya had changed into his flying form, which Anguirus was ill-suited to fight against. Going back in, I fought against the flying form with Mothra, which seemed fitting. Mothra was weaker than Anguirus, but was much better equipped to dodge and counter flying Destroya's attacks, so the fight was in my favor. However, Destroya changed into his final form sooner than expected, which drastically turned the tables. Mothra's attacks were doing very little to Destroya, and I had to move furiously to avoid damage while waiting for the timer to run out. Even though it would be near impossible to beat Destroya with Mothra, I still had three other monsters. Final Form Destroya was very resistant to taking damage, and the heavily armored foe would not be defeated without a long fight. In the last part of the fight, I wasn't using much strategy, just attacking as brutally and as fast as I could. On its last bar of health, Destroya tried one last counter-attack, a beam of energy from its chest. I don't know how powerful it would have been, because just before it could fire, I punched Destroya in the chest cavity, destroying him. And then that was it. The last kaiju boss was gone. In the midst of all the excitement, I had briefly forgotten that there was still one last thing to do before the game would be over. 
seeing the icon again hit me like a ton of bricks. I had come so far to get to this point, but I was terrified. I really did not want to know what this last encounter was going to be like. Before I could let myself think about it any longer, I moved Godzilla over and began the stage. And when the screen changed, there was... Nothing. Just Godzilla in a black screen. I walked back and forth, fired a heat beam. Nothing happened. Until... Oh. Dear. God. That was my first thought on realizing I would have to fight Red, the creature that tormented me through nearly the whole game. How would I be able to fight something that can kill me with one touch? It seemed impossible. Thankfully, Red was no longer able to deliver one-hit kills. But despite that, this was still the most difficult battle I've ever faced, in this game or otherwise. If I had any real comprehension of what I was getting into before I started the fight, I would have never done it. I very soon learned what a horrible mistake I had made. Red reached out and clawed at Godzilla, and when those claws cut through him, I felt it. I know it's common for people to cringe up when their video game character gets hit or loses a life, but this was not that. This was genuine, physical pain. When the pain struck me, I paused the game. I hadn't suffered any actual injuries, but it felt just like my shoulder had been clawed through. I had seen and experienced many unpleasant things at this point, but the game causing me real pain was where I drew the line. Yes, I would be disappointed that I didn't get to see the ending, but the risk was no longer worth it. I was about to get up and take one last screenshot and turn off the NES, when I realized something else. I couldn't get up. I was paralyzed to my seat. The only muscles I could move were my fingers and thumbs. As the terror set in, a new message appeared on the screen. I started to scream, but only a weak choking sound was coming out. I desperately tried to get my body to move, but it did nothing. I was looking in every direction, then I looked over at the computer. Since Red could hear what I was saying, I tried begging him to let me go. From here things start to get hazy as I was under extreme stress at the time, but from what I can remember I said, I'm sorry! I'm sorry I insulted you! I didn't mean it! I didn't know things would get this serious! Please just let me go! If you let me go, I promise I'll never tell anyone or turn on the game ever again, please! And Red replied, Only one will survive. The statement could not be any more clear. If I couldn't kill Red, then he would kill me. Like an idiot, I had played around with something I didn't understand, and now it might cost me my life. I stopped struggling to move and accepted the reality of the situation. There was only one way to get out of this alive. I had to kill Red. It all went by so fast. If it weren't for the screenshots, I might not have remembered any of this. Just like in the chase levels, Red moved at a horrifyingly fast speed and there was barely enough time to process a thought. And thus, there was no time to form a strategy. I had to rely solely on wits and reflexes. To make things worse, there was no way to predict what kind of attacks Red might use, so I constantly had to be on the offensive and defensive. I felt every hit that Godzilla took. They all hurt. I tried so hard to avoid the damage, but every attack that I dodged left me vulnerable to another and the pain would only get worse. After he jumped over me, Red's eyes started to glow. I moved as far back as I could and ducked, but there was no dodging this one. When this hit me, I really did scream. I screamed so loud that someone else in the apartment should have heard me, but they didn't. Just looking at the image hurts me, making me remember the incinerating burn. I paused the game because it hurt so bad, but Red unpaused the game to attack me again, which made me furious. I immediately counter-attacked him with the heat beam, again and again until the power meter was totally diminished. I wanted Red to hurt like I did. 
Just before the timer ran out, Red transitioned into his swimming form. I didn't think the timer would still be affecting a battle like this. I'm thankful for it because it gave me a few minutes to collect my thoughts and decide what to do next. I chose to fight Red's next two forms with the monsters I had encountered them with, so Anguirus was next. It probably wasn't all that smart of an idea, but it's what I did. I jumped up and heat beamed Red in the face, and he moved off screen where I couldn't reach him. Then a wave of large mines started to fall from above. I felt this was unfair, so I shouted, If you're going to cheat, why do you even let me use the controller? And then he came at me, rushing from the top left of the screen downwards. Damn it! Now I wouldn't even be able to see where his next attack was coming from. Red continued to strike from random angles, so I constantly moved to swerve around him. Another 40 seconds went by and Anguirus was nearly gone, but together we had forced Red into his flying form, so it was Mothra's turn next. Deciding to fight Red with Mothra was a terrible idea. Mothra was constantly overwhelmed by Red, and the life meter was devastated in a mere 15 seconds. And once Mothra's life was down to two bars, Red did something I didn't see coming. He reached out, grabbed Mothra, and ate her. After Mothra was devoured, I felt an agonizing pain, like being crushed to death. Mothra had been killed for my stupidity, and I would share the pain. It was a short transition from battle to the board, but it felt like an hour. The pain combined with being unable to move was driving me insane. I wanted so badly for this to end. I never wanted anything so much. But I still had hope. There was only one monster left that could be brought to full health by engaging Red in battle. Solomon. If any of them had a chance to save my life now, it would be him. Solomon apparently had some history with Red, as when the fight started this dialogue happened. Red took me by surprise again by immediately burning me with his demonic fire a second time. As much as it hurt, it actually worked to my advantage. Since Solomon started at full life, he still had some to spare, but now Red had used up all his energy and could not use his ultimate weapon any longer. Now he would die. As he drew close to the end of his life bar, Red turned his whole body to face the screen and flew upwards, then slammed back down in an attempt to crush Solomon. When that failed to work, he tried to devour Solomon like he had Mothra, but he wouldn't be eating my monster this time. I thought I had won, but something was wrong. Red wasn't sinking to the bottom, and I still couldn't move. Red was still alive. After his seeming defeat by Solomon, Red had reconstructed his body into his gigantic final form, transporting us to a blazing inferno in the process. It was reminiscent of our first encounter, except now the scenery, much like the true power of Red, had become very real. The music had erupted into a loud blaring sound, a furious drum of death. Faced against Red's insane amount of health, my own demise was imminent. Solomon was my strongest monster, but not even he stood a chance. It was like trying to fight a mountain. Within seconds, Solomon was overpowered and dropped to the floor, when Red crushed him to death underneath his foot. The sadistic demon took his time as he snapped Solomon's vertebrae and ribs like dry, brittle twigs. I could tell he was enjoying our pain. This is hopeless. I'm a dead man. I had no choice but to send another monster to his death. We were all going to die. I only hoped they would forgive me. After decreasing Red's health by a minuscule amount, Anguirus was also obliterated. Red unleashed a hail of blazing hot needles into his face until he collapsed. Another moment of unspeakable agony, then nothingness as my ally faded away.
I asked Red how he knew my name, and then he said it. For years, she was being tortured by something nobody understood. Now I knew what it was. Now I understood why I was being mocked about Melissa's death, and how the game knew about it. Because he knew about it. Because he was the one responsible. And this time... This time he was going to kill me. I was taken back to the board to send Godzilla to his final stand. Barely anything was left of the board. Just Godzilla and Red's icons and... the fifth monster. In the midst of everything that was happening, I had completely forgotten about it. I tried yet again to select it. I cursed, I begged, I screamed at it to do something, anything to help me! But to no avail. There was only one thing to do. I knew Godzilla didn't stand any more of a chance than the rest did, but maybe... Maybe now that all the other monsters were gone, the fifth monster might finally awaken. I managed to get the creature's icon selected, and I pressed the A button as fast as I could. The icon started to shake, as if it were desperately trying to move. It was then that Red decided he was done playing fair, and before I could activate the monster, he went for the killing blow, paralyzing my heart. My hands started to become numb and unfeeling, but even as my vision was fading away, I still tried to press the A button. Red was surely breaking one of his rules, but he must have thought that if he could kill me quickly, then it would be too late for any consequences to matter. He would have won. He was wrong. Red's power was being challenged by another force. It prevented him from killing me. And when I regained my vision, I saw a familiar sight. I asked, who are you? You already know me. I am Melissa. How is that possible? Red told me that he killed you. It's true. Even after death, he tortures me. If you can't stop him, he'll do the same to you. But how will I be able to stop him now? Her words stirred something inside of me. I wasn't going to die like this. And now I had more to fight for than just my own life. I had to fight to save Melissa and the world she inhabits. With her help, the fifth monster was finally unleashed. Acacius, the Golden Light. It was time to end this once and for all. Together we would take this damned hellspawn out of existence. Acacius was by far the strongest playable monster in the game. He had to be if we were to have any chance of surviving. His punch involved turning his hands into blades, which caused tremendous damage. But Red had more than enough life to spare. In the end, this would come down to pure skill. With one final strike, Red was destroyed. His body disintegrated and sank below, accompanied by a soar of triumphant music. Slowly the paralysis wore off, and I was able to stand up again. We had done it. Melissa's death had been avenged, and I felt overwhelming happiness. 
until I remembered all the death and pain that led up to this point. All the other monsters who had fought and died. I was about to mourn them, but the game had yet to conclude. Tears of joy streamed down my face and I broke out crying. I cried harder than I have in several years. Maybe in my whole life. All I had been through, all I had discovered, and now the game was coming to an end. But before she and all the others left, Melissa had something to tell me. I am Zachary, and at the time I write this, it has been three weeks since the fateful night when I played the NES Godzilla game, going back to that night, to immediately after I turned off the NES. Once I was able to start walking around again, the first thing I did was unplug the NES, take out the cartridge, and then put them in separate sock drawers. I looked over the computer. All the screenshots you've seen in the story were saved. I backed up all the images on a flash drive before I turned the computer off, just in case. After that, I hit the bed and instantly passed out. It was not a restful sleep, but one of complete exhaustion. It felt like no time had passed before I awoke again. And what a day that was. The first thought I recall coming to mind was, What the hell happened last night? I thought about it for a short while, until it occurred to me to contact the person I got the game from to begin with. My friend. Billy. So I called him up and told him to just come over to my apartment, which he did. I showed him the screenshots and gave him a very basic summary of what had happened. At first he thought I was just pulling a joke on him, but he soon realized this was not the case. Once it hit him that it was real, he was speechless. He made it clear that he had absolutely not tampered with the game, and he had no idea about any of this. So then the obvious question was asked to Billy. Where did you get the game? I got the simple answer of, from another friend of mine that I trade games with. He assured me that this was a trustworthy person, and that he had never had any issues with games he got from him before. So then Billy called him, but when we told this guy the story, he was as shocked and surprised as anyone, except he abruptly hung up on us. This clearly was going nowhere. Before Billy left that day, he asked me if I wanted him to take the cartridge and dispose of it. I sharply declined. He asked how I could possibly still want to keep the thing. I told him that I needed time to think it over, and that was that. Billy and I haven't talked much since. Even though I've told him that this isn't the case, I get the impression that Billy thinks what happened with the game is his fault. After he left that day, I did a lot of thinking. It was very hard for me to do anything else, really. I couldn't stop thinking about the game. There were so many questions left unanswered. What was Red? Was Melissa really in the game? How did she get there? Why did all of this happen with this game? But the one question that kept me for many nights was, Red said that he had known me for a long time. How? Ever since then, I can't shake this feeling of being watched. The game made me ask myself questions about death and reality in ways that I never wanted to think about. I'm not too sure of anything anymore. Constantly thinking about it soon began to have a negative impact on my life. I just didn't care about anything else at this point. By comparison, all the other day-to-day -day activities seemed pointless. I eventually decided that I had to choose between one of two things, try to play the game again, or destroy it. I tried several times to convince myself to try the former, but I never got farther than plugging the NES back up. 
Just touching the cartridge made me remember all the pain I felt during that fight with Red. I wondered if perhaps playing the game again myself might cause something terrible to happen. I didn't know anything about how this game worked, and it was too risky. I wasn't sure I could stand another round of the game anyway. So then it was time for the other option. Wanting to get some fresh air, I took the game with me and drove to the lake, planning to throw it in. I got up to the lake with the cartridge in my hands, and I looked down on it and... I thought of Melissa. If what I had experienced with the game was indeed genuine, doing what I did may have been the only way to save her from an endless torture. In a way, this warped game might have saved her soul. Damn it. Once that thought came into my head, I knew then that I wouldn't be able to destroy it. So I just sat down at a bench, gazing at the lake for about an hour. Ultimately, I decided on a third option. Selling the game on eBay. It may be selfish, but I promise you this has nothing to do with the money. I don't care how much or how little I get paid for this game. Believe me. It's selfish because I don't want the responsibility of owning the cartridge anymore. I can't dwell on this forever, and the only way I can deal with this is by putting the game out of my life. So this brings me to one of the main reasons I've created a summary of these events. First is to record the details while I can remember them, and second is that whoever bids on this game knows what they're getting into. I can't guarantee the safety of anyone else who plays the game, or that anything will happen at all. But to the new owner of the game, remember this. Be careful. And if you do feel as if the game is literally messing with your mind, SHUT THE DAMN THING OFF!